Okay, we are now recording. Uh, so, uh, for those who like to stay on, I'm just letting you know, we are recording this session. And the reason we record these sessions is for those who may not be able to get on at this time, we upload these videos up to YouTube where you can have access to them 24-7. All right, uh, again, welcome. Uh, I hope everyone is having a blessed Sabbath. And uh, we're going to continue to worship throughout these Sabbath hours. Uh, we have a lot to present to you to keep you up to date of what's going on in these last days. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Our disclaimers, any information presented in this presentation is of the opinion and research of the presenters and those individuals commenting and is provided for general information and educational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional advice. We will have our welcome, then we will have our opening prayer. We will talk about the updates, the increased cases, world, U.S., and Georgia, and how COVID-19 deaths are spiking. Uh, we would then look at the protests. We did hear from our Hope Channel with Pat, uh, Pastor Morris and from the North American Division of South Division uh, Seventh-day Adventist, the uh, North American Division President. Uh, where they commented on dealing with these protests that are going on. And then we will talk about the storm, the tornado that hit Tennessee, but the Lord spared, it is written headquarters. Then we will go into our half nuggets, when our uh, half nugget today is dealing with Daisy, and then also dealing with temperance, part one. Then we will talk about are you prepared and we will have our prayer for the group and then we will go into our study on little time of trouble and then we will have our questions and answers final comments and then the closing prayer for god has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind second timothy 1 7 though he slay me yet will i trust in him but I will maintain my own ways before him, Job 13, 15. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, 2 Peter 1, 19. Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. I will now ask and see if Pastor Sherrod is on for the opening prayer. Pastor Sherrod? Okay. Uh, Pastor Tobias, are you on? Yes, I'm on. Okay, could you go ahead and give us the opening prayer, please? Okay. Loving Father in heaven, we're thankful for another Sabbath. We're thankful for the fellowship we can still enjoy one with another. Our Father, we ask that you would be with our meeting this afternoon. In spite of the circumstances surrounding our country, and the world, we know that you're still on the throne of the universe. Bless us now, bless the presenters. This I pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, let's talk about the updates. Increased cases and deaths. If you notice, as of June 6th, uh, the numbers are not going down, people. They are steadily going up. Uh, our cases to date for the world is over 6 million, where before was at 5 plus million. Uh, the death toll is now at 396,459 versus 366,654. With the U.S., we are hitting almost the 2 million mark. We had at 1,897,000 versus 1,750,000. Our death toll is at 109,143 versus the one, uh, 103,000 the pre previous week. 
people, you're seeing how these numbers are going up within one week. Georgia uh, is at 50,621 cases, and with the previous week only being about 46,000. Deaths today is at 2,174, and the previous week was 2,002. Now, by U.S. states, New York is still uh, in first uh, with their increased cases. I'm not going to repeat all the numbers. You can see them on the screen. Oh, I forgot some of them are calling in. We'll not be able to see the screen. Well, New York was over last week, was at 369 plus thousand. Now they're at 376 plus thousand. Uh, their death was at 29, uh, a little bit over 29. They're now at 30,000 plus. New Jersey, the second state, at 163,000 cases, where previously they had 158, a little over, uh, 27,433 deaths versus 11,531. Ooh, that's a big one. Okay, Illinois, 125,915, 117. And they went uh, for their deaths 5,795 to uh, from 5,270. California is at 126,000 plus uh, versus the 107 previous week, and deaths is at 4,550 versus 4,000. Massachusetts is at 102,000 uh, plus. Uh, previous week was at 95,000 plus, and death. Uh, 7,235 uh, previous week was 6,718. Let's take a look at Georgia by counties. Fulton County is still leading uh, with their number of cases. Uh, they increased uh, some. Uh, their deaths also increased from, two from 229 to 250. Gwinnett County, uh, 4,000. Uh, up from 3,000 and deaths uh, up from 127 to 136. DeKalb County, 3,986 uh, cases uh, from the previous 37, deaths up from 112 to 124. Cobb County, 3,223 up from 3,000, deaths up from 170 to 194. Hall County, uh, 2,500. Uh, up from 24 plus uh, 47 previous up to 50 deaths. Doherty, 1,796 up from 1,769 up from 144 to 149 deaths. Clayton, 1,300 up from 1,200 uh, up from 45 deaths up to 52 deaths. Uh, like I said, ladies and gentlemen, you um, brothers and sisters, you still seeing these numbers are climbing. Uh, South America, they talked about South America. Uh, South America, they uh, hit over the mark that they are really spiking. And then also CNN reported that it was over 1,000 corona deaths reported in the past 24 hours. Official fear protests will drive up numbers. And this is in a little over a week, and this was updated as of yesterday. American has gone from taking their first hesitant steps outside again to marching in tightly packed crowds in cities all over the country. Any uncertainty about venturing out during the corona uh, pandemic has been seemingly put aside by many to protest po po police brutality after watching the video of George Floyd fatally pinned under an officer knee in Ma uh, Minneapolis. This is the corona staggering toll in the U.S. Protesters often without masks have shouted Floyd's name and during arrests po police have load loaded them into vehicles and holding cells making it difficult to social distance. Despite this uh, sudden shift, corona is still spreading. Since Sunday, they had 4,430 deaths in the U.S. has been reported. And of those, 1,036 deaths were between Thursday morning and the same time Friday. Again, like I said, the numbers are really increasing here. Uh, and that was by CNN. Now, I'm just going to see if this is going to play. 
or I, I tell you, it's the quickest way for me to do it this way. Here in Mexico City have once again recorded the largest single day increase in newly confirmed cases since this outbreak began reporting uh, nearly 4,000 additional cases on Tuesday evening. They also reported uh, nearly 500 newly confirmed deaths. That brings uh, their respective totals to nearly 100,000 total cases uh, and now more than 10,000 confirmed deaths. And that is part of the reason. All right. Did you hear that? Okay. So they are really on the rise in that country and so forth. So again, people, let's continue to wash our hands, wear our masks when we go out, and those that are uh, have some health issues, uh, please continue to stay in and observe what they say. And you know, if you need to go out, uh, please continue to wear your mask and wash your hands. Uh, protests regarding George Floyd. Hope Channel came in with a message uh, from Hope Channel. Let's see. Oh yeah, I got the North, let me just go ahead and do the North American Division. I misplaced my sheet for the Hope Channel, uh, but uh, Oh, I have it here. I'm sorry. I have it right here uh, from Pastor uh, Derek Morris. It says the event currently taking place here in North America are heartbreaking, blatant racism against blacks, injustice, violence, bigotry, and hate. My heart is heavy over the murder of George Floyd, Amon Aubrey, and Breonna Taylor, and countless others who have suffered unjustly and were tragically taken from us. As Christians, when we see senseless acts of violence upon our brothers and sisters, our souls must be stirred to speak out, to take action, because if we are silent, our silence condemns us. Jesus said, when you see people who are in need, when you see justice that needs to happen, when you act in the name of Jesus, Matthew 25, 40, Jesus said, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did for me. At Hope China, we are committed by creating programs that will reveal the measurable and unfailing love of God. But we also need to let that love be manifested in us and through us. We need to reveal by the way that we live that we have a connection with Jesus. I want to appeal to you to join with us in prayer and in action as the Holy Spirit leads because change is possible when the Holy Spirit guides our steps. Yes, we long for that new day, a world where righteousness dwells. But until that day, we have a work to do. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world, Matthew 5, 13, 14. My prayer for you as I pray for myself in this time of turmoil is that we will allow the immeasurable and unfailing love of God to flow through us, to make a difference in the lives of those around us. So that was uh, by Hope Channel and by our North American uh, division uh, from our president, Daniel R. Jackson. He also addressed the issue as it has been an invigorated and challenging role and one where God has blessed us and where your faithful commitment uh, to him has allowed the church in our division to carry our mission. The reason that I am coming to you today, however, is difficult, different. Like many of you, I am heartbroken as a result of the wanton and hateful violence that led to the death of George Floyd. One cannot describe this in any other way than what it is, a horrible illustration of what happens when men feel that they are superior to others. This thinking allows racism and prejudice to grow. It provides the fuel that power, hatred, and murder. This incident, furthermore, is one of a series of actions per perpetrated against blacks in America. Together, these experiences lead us, uh, us all to question the guarantee of freedom and justice and shine in the constitution of the nations that make up our division. To my African-American brothers and sisters, 
I want you to know that I am deeply sorry. I am saddened that you have experienced prejudice and bigotry, even in the church, and that there has been times when you were not allowed eat in the same cafeteria or go to the same washrooms as whites. I am deeply sorry that you have experienced these things. As a white man, I know little of your suffering, but I suffer with you today as you look out at a future that seems uncertain. It is wrong that you should live with fear because of your color. I am sorry. Together with hundreds of thousands of other white people, I want to say to you, I love you. You are my flesh and blood in Jesus. And it goes on, he goes on. I'm not going to read the complete letter, but you have people that are speaking out, uh, dealing with this protest, and also we're looking at the last days on into the little times of trouble. This is one of the uh, target stories how the protesters damaged properties uh, of different stores, Walmart, CVS, Targets, and other stores. Uh, unnecessarily. This does not portray the love for our brothers and sisters. Uh, this is done of Satan and not done of Christ. Okay? Now, uh, we're in the tornado and hurricane season, uh, and so uh, we don't know how many of you are prepared, but we will be doing a preparedness class uh, for you to prepare for disasters. Uh, the Lord really spared our, uh, it is written, headquarters, if you look at this picture, the tornado touched down just feet away from, it is written, ministry headquarters in Collegedale, Tennessee, and this happened on April 13th. Uh, if you look at the footage that the flattened dozens of trees just on the other side of the building's driveway, the storm came just days before it is written was set to begin the Hope Awakening, a virtual online ev evangelistic series. Uh, they were truly, truly blessed. And if you notice, look at all the trees did not come toward that building. We must keep our faith in the Lord as we go through trying times, uh, these troubling times and so forth, not depend on ourselves, not depend on man, but depend on the Lord and he will protect us. At this time, we would now have our health message. Uh, our health disclaimer is that we do not provide any kind of medical fitness health advice. The use or reliance of any information contained in this presentation, please consult your health provider. Our health nugget today is dealing with Daisy, and our new start is dealing with temperance. We would now have Miss Cynthia uh, Calaman to present Daisy. What are the benefits of Daisy? Miss Cynthia? Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Um, today, we're talking about daisies. These things grow in my backyard, and they're very plentiful, and I just wondered if there was uh, anything good or how could they be used. So I looked it up, and I found a lot. Um, number one, okay, the health benefits of daisies. Number one, they brighten skin. Number two, they can uh, lessen the color of your dark spots. Number three, they prevent saggy skin. Number four, they help with uh, respiratory problems. Number five, digestive health. Number six, treat wounds. Number seven, useful for heavy menstruation. Number eight, they can lower fever. Uh, nine, rheumatic pain. Number 10, detoxification. The traditional uses are, uh, traditionally it is used for wounds and to treat delicate and listless children. In folk medicine, it is used for rheumatism. Uh, dried flowering heads are used in decoctions, infusions, poultice and ointments in treating rheumatism, liver, arthritis and kidney disorders. Leaves are applied externally to bruises, wounds, and cuts. Use, use the extract internally for treating inflammatory disorders of the liver. Chew the leaves to cure oral ulcers. Root decoction is used for treating eczema. Flowers are used for treating disorders of respiratory tract and gastrointestinal tract. It is also used as a cure for fresh wounds. 
uh, used with distilled water internally for treating liver inflammatory disorders. The mild decoction eases respiratory tract complaints, painful menstruation, and rheum rheum rheumatic pains. Um, in folk medicine, daisy is used to provide relief from cough, slow bleeding, and improve digestion. Um, just like last week, um, when you're dealing with daisies, if you are allergic to ragweed, chrysanthemums, marigolds, and daisies, and others in that family don't use, um, don't use daisies. And of course, as always, please check with your healthcare provider before taking anything, okay? Um, let me see. And, oh, okay, you can use the flowers and the leaves. You can use the petals and the flower buds. The young leaves are cooked or consumed in raw salads, and it is used as a vitamin supplement and also as a tea. Thank you very much. And please, if you have a chance, uh, go online to look at the benefits of daisies that grow in your backyard. Thank you and have a blessed Sabbath. Amen. Thank you. All right. So don't throw away those daisies. Okay. They're good for you. And now we will have Pastor Jones to deal with our health start. Okay. Thank you, Pam. Good afternoon to each. Temperance, part one, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25 says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. We need to understand the true meaning of temperance, for it is one of the eight laws which is vital for complete health. God's plans for us must include all eight laws of health. These are God's laws for health and they do work. Temperance means to be self-disciplined, abstain or sober. The desire for more and more is not only driving stress and affecting our mental and physical health. The desire for more and more, I want more of this and more of that, it causes strength, uh, stress and it affects our mental and physical health. Uh, please take note notice here True temperance, therefore, is found governing every activity of life. For example, it not only asks you what you eat, but why you eat it, how much you eat, and when you eat. It is the what, the when, and the how much of everything we do. Please, let's not forget that. That's very important in temperance. What and when and how much of everything we do. Do you exercise enough? Are you overworking? Do you have sufficient leisure and recreation? Is the time you allow uh, to sleep sufficient? Is your food of high quality? And is it what you need? Councils on Health, page 28. Uh, please take notice again. True temperance not only deals with the physical, but also derives into, dives deep into the mental and spiritual phases of your life. It calls in question the thoughts you think, ask you why you think them, and whether they strengthen or destroy. It makes you analyze your underlying passion and motive of life. The sole governing force 
asking whether they are right with God and man, and whether the faculties that control behavior are weaken, weakening or strengthening your physical, mental, and spiritual life. Councils on Health page, also page 28. The laws of temperance must control the life of every Christian. God is to be in all our thoughts. His glory is, is to be kept in view. We must break away from every influence that would captivate our thoughts and lead us from God. We are under we are under strict obligations to God so to govern our bodies and rule our appetites and passions that they will not lead us away from purity and holiness or take our minds from the work God requires of us to do. Remember, temperance is one law that holds the other seven laws together. In First Peter chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible says, But the end of all things is now close at hand, therefore be sober. Be sober-minded and temperate so that you may give yourselves to prayer. We bought New Testament translation of that verse. Thank you very much. And let's remember to be temperate in everything we do so we can be healthy and glorify God in these last days. Okay. Thank you, Pastor, for that. And we have to remember the intemperance. We also have to keep that immune system up uh, as we go through this uh, pandemic. So don't forget about that. All right. Are you prepared when a storm catches you by surprise? Uh, Paul uh, Dillinger was not prepared when a storm hit their uh, home. Okay, it said, I was just putting our baby son, Ethan, down for a nap. It was a beautiful sunny day. Some clouds had just rolled over in the cool of the evening, and then it hit, and it hit fast and hard. Ethan had just fallen asleep when I heard my wife, Natasha, calling from the living room. I came out of the bedroom and looked out the window, and the first thing I noticed was the wind. It was blowing incredibly hard, and the sky was getting darker and darker. Then we heard the tree limbs crash, clam, snap. They were literally breaking off of trees and slamming into the side of the house from the woods nearby. I looked out the other side of our cabin to see our greenhouse completely deskinned. The entire plastic top had completely torn off. I grabbed my phone to check the weather, but the internet was out. Honey, should we go? I heard Natasha saying, yes, let's go, I responded. We grabbed sleeping Ethan from off the bed and I threw my laptop into my backpack when we darted for the car. Spooked that at any moment a flying limb or fallen tree could intercept our flight. We prayed as we flew along the dirt road up to my parents' house where the basement would be a much safer place to wait out the storm. Already a tree had fallen across our driveway uh, that we had to circumvent. Thankfully, we would, or we could. By now, it was pouring rain, and so through the blinding rain and raging wind, we finally made it to the basement of my parents and to safety. And here's the crazy thing. None of us saw us coming. No one. My uncle had been out on the tractor and had to ditch it and run inside. He had also had a greenhouse that was descanted like ours, and another one that flared a lot of worse, looked like an elephant stepped on it. The storm hit us unexpectedly and we weren't prepared. Thankfully, 
we are all safe and everyone is okay. But it still hit us unprepared. Kind of like how this COVID-19 pandemic hit our world unprepared. And here, the thing we know, there are more storms coming according to Bible prophecy. The question is, how are we preparing to weather those storms? Frankly, as a gardener, you realize that you aren't in control of nature. The wind, the rain, the sun, the snow, you simply can't control it. You can plan ahead and prepare for it if you have a good weather forecast. But sometimes things happen that we couldn't foresee. Then what? I tell you what we do. We pray. We recognize that God is in control even when crazy things happen. And then we get up and keep going. When life comes crashing down around us, we've got to get up and rebuild. The storms of life may knock us down, but we've got to reach out to the strength of God and move forward. For us, our greenhouse was a small loss. Sure, it cost us a bit of cash and some time to fix, but within a few days, we had the plastic back on and the time we hoped that we uh, were more prepared should such a situation occur again. But what about the storms of life? What about the physical, emotional, spiritual, spiritual and economic storms created by COVID-19? How are you responding? How will you rebuild? What lessons are you learning? What will prepare, what will prepare you for future storms? When things happen that are outside of your control, where do you turn for strength and comfort? Jesus is our anchor and hope. We can turn to him, our Prince of Peace, who can calm storms and with a word from his lips. We can turn to him to bring us through the storms of life and even through the end times. Will you trust in him today? Isaiah 26, 3, 4 says, You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you. Because to trust in you, trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Our heart questions today is how have you reacted to the worldwide pandemic? How has this affected or not affected your faith in Jesus? Are you willing to trust in him for the next unexpected storm in your life? And do you believe that Jesus can truly be your everlasting rock? Ask God to show you any areas of your life where you might have not given him full access to. Anything you might be unwilling to give up control over, ask him to forgive you and to help you trust in him. Maybe this pandemic crisis has revealed to you some things in your life where you have been lacking to exercise faith. Pray to our loving Jesus to help you to surrender all to him and to learn to trust in him despite the storms of life. And these are some of the Bible texts uh, that you can read, Isaiah 4, 6, 25, 4, Psalms 23, 4, Psalms 34, 17 to 20, and Psalms 57, 1, Psalms 91, 1, 2, Psalms 107, 25, and Psalms 107, 29, Nahum 1, 7, and Matthew 8, 26 to 27. Your commitment, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I would now ask uh, Pastor Tobias once more if you can have a word of prayer uh, for those that were protesting and those that were hurt during the protesting and those that are still affected by COVID-19 and our young people. Let us pray. Lord, Father in heaven, we're thankful that we are still here. We're thankful for your watch care. And Father, we pray that you'll be with those who have been involved in the protesting, be with those who have been affected by the protest, the old and the young, and Father, we pray that you would calm the storm and be with all your children everywhere. For we are all your children, each and every one of us. 
Bless us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, at this time, we would now turn it over to Mr. Fred Irvin, uh, dealing with the little time of trouble. Okay, hold on. Let me let me get him on the right track here. Okay. All right, Mr. Irvin. Yes. Good evening and welcome. It is a blessing to be here worshiping with you all this Sabbath day. Right now we have been studying for the last, um, since March the, uh, March the 14th. We have studied a lot of things and we have seen many things taking place lately. Look what happened this week with the riots and the protesters and all from uh, the uh, George Floyd. And we know that this is the first time, this is the largest that we have seen in 50 years since uh, Dr. King was assassinated. We've been talking about all of these things coming back to back. And we know that we have had many uh, other deaths and things going on but God is taking the rings in his own hands. And right now things are happening quickly. We see that with this, uh, what happened this past week, all of us have observed and we are all of God's children. It was Satan who has caused the division. And right now we just pray for one another and we are not to fear anything. And so with the same time, the virus is going on. So here we have studied this last uh, few months about the, the, uh, the first one about the, uh, the Laodicean message in Revelation chapter 3. And we are lukewarm. We, have, we feel that as, a, as though we have need of nothing, but we are blind, wretched, naked. And here we went on and studied about the uh, beginning of sorrow, just like a woman have her baby nine months and then the ninth month she have uh, labor pains and those labor pains get closer and closer and we know that that's the beginning of sorrow for her so we have studied the beginning of sorrow because we have seen the fires floods earthquakes with all of these different things coming back to back record breaking and the Lord says when we see all of these things not some of them all of these things it will be near even at the doors and that this generation shall not pass till all is fulfilled. We are not setting dates. We understand that there is no test of time prophecy since 1844. But we are to know what time it is. So now we know that also we are standing on the threshold of the crisis of the ages. When we see all these things coming back to back, there should be no doubt with us. Because as the days of Noah, Jesus says in Matthew 24, verses 37, about as the days of Noah were, so shall it be. So now, today's subject is the time of trouble, the early time of trouble, or the little time of trouble. But first, I would like to mention the time of trouble. The time of trouble. It says, the first part of the time of trouble occurs before the close of probation. You know, our people think that we are in the little time of trouble now, but we are not. So we must speak with clarity today about the time of trouble. And it says it's in three parts. The first period is often called the little time of trouble. Perhaps a more accurate term could be the early time of trouble. This will start when our country passed the first Sunday law. The first Sunday law is called the National Sunday Law. It's not, we call it a blue law, but it's a National Sunday Law. It has to go before the three branches of government. 
and then become the law of the land. The National Sunday Law, after it is passed, will start the little time of trouble, or early time of trouble. Those two names, it's the same. Or early time of trouble, in view of the fact that the great time of trouble is when the plagues are poured out, comes later. The early time of trouble continue for a short period. For a short period. Protestant, and we want you to know that Protestantism shall give the hand of fellowship to the Roman power. We remember that there was no, uh, uh, like when President, uh, uh, well, he was running for President uh, Kennedy. Everybody was worried because they thought he would take his orders from the Pope. But he assured them he would not. And so here, the uh, Catholic did not, was not in power that much in this country because we had cut the ties with the Catholic Church after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. And we cut our ties in 1867 after the Civil War, and we didn't join back with the Catholic Church, had no ties until 1984, when William Wilson was the first ambassador to the Vatican. So here we find that the Protestantism shall give the hand of fellowship to the Roman power, see the word, then, once they do that, he says, then there will be a law against the Sabbath of God's creation. And then it is that God will do his strange work in the earth. He will belong, he has belong with the perversity of the race. He has tried to win them to himself. But the time will come when they shall have filled their measure of iniquity, and then it is that God will work. This time is almost reach. The word then, the definition, because each one said then it would be this time then. So now we notice how the the Catholic majority in the in the uh, Supreme Court is Roman Catholic now, and we know that the the Protestant is joining back. They are the daughters of Rome. And now, with them giving the fellowship, but it won't be complete until they pass this national Sunday law. It says, then, the word definition says, at that time, immediately, next in order of time, at the same time. So we are experiencing that right now. So you'll go to Mark 13, 7 and 8, Luke 21, verses 9 through 11. St. Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 through 8. Because when it says this now, we know that uh, these are the beginning of sorrow. And we are standing there now. The next thing is to happen, because all these other signs are here. The next thing, we don't know when, but there will be a national son of loss one day soon. And here we know that the Pope was supposed, of Rome was supposed to call all the leaders together on the 14th of May of this year because of the calamities and want to bring in a son in law. He was talking about the uh, calamities, even the forest fires take a break on Sunday. It rests on Sunday. And also, they were talking about the global climate change. And they were pointing all these things out. We don't know what's going to happen this summer with the hurricane season. So with all these calamities at the same time, and watch what it says here, it is the time of the national apostasy when acting on the policy of Satan, the rulers of the land will rank themselves on the side of the man of sin. It is then the measure of guilt is full. National apostasy is the signal for national ruin. And when they pass this national son of law, it will be just like when we got to remember when Lot, when he had to leave Sodom, they couldn't find 10 righteous. So at the time when he fled, fled Sodom, we know that the angels let them out. And you know the story. So here 
when this country passed this national Sunday law, it become the law of the land, they would have turned their backs on the fourth commandment, which says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The seventh day, not the first day, because Sunday is one of the six working days. And then it says, Roman Catholic principles will be taken under the care and protection of the state. Now, that's what's going on now, because the Supreme Court is uh, the, the Catholic principles, if they go against their principles, they could be disfellowed, they could be excommunicated. And so here, um, and they tell us that American citizens, you don't vote for us if you don't like what we are doing, too bad. This national apostasy will be speedy, will speedily be followed by national ruin. So we can expect when the Son of Law is passed, we will go into the little time of trouble. That will be official. Right now, the Supreme Court is made up of mostly Roman Catholic. And as of, we, okay, it says, we ask the question, the United States of America, when will our probation end as a country? The peoples, and we have been a favorite people, the peoples of the United States have been a favorite people, but when they restrict religious liberty, surrender Protestantism, and give countries to popery, we observing that now, the measure of their guilt will be full, and national apostasy will be fought, will be registered in the books of heaven. So may this apostasy be a sign to us that the limit of God's forbearance is reached, that the measure of our nation iniquity is full. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When Protestantism shall get, stretch her hand across a gulf to grasp hands of the Roman power, when she shall reach across the abyss to grasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehood, all of that teaching, and delusion, then we, we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan, and that the end is near. As the approach of the Roman armies was a sign to the disciples of the impending destruction of Jerusalem, so may this apostasy be a sign to us that the limit of God's forbearance is reached, that the measure of our nation iniquity is full, and that the angel of mercy is about to take her flight, never to return. And that will be the time national apostasy will be followed by national ruin when they Past that Sunday law, we will disconnect ourselves from righteousness, from heaven. God has been protecting this country more than any other country that the sun shines. Just like the hurricanes when they come towards the United States and they hit and they come across and go back up the co coast. Uh, they, but God has been protecting this country and the scientist says it's just like a big hand is pushing the storms back out to sea. Also around our large cities, they said it's just like a bubble. When the, the storms get to our cities, seem like it dissipate or go around and keep going, except a year or two ago when it, the tornado hit downtown Atlanta. We can tell say knows he have a short time because he's been permitted to do things he never did before. It says, move at that time, just like the the Jerusalem. Remember in Matthew chapter 24, and we find that uh, uh, verse 14, 
it says this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in in all the world as a witness unto all nations then shall the end come paul preached this message in ad 64 you will find it recorded in Colossum, the first chapter verse 23 paul said because this message had to have been preached to every creature which is on the heaven paul said in Colossians the first chapter verse 23 he says that the gospel has now been preached to every creature on the heaven where i paul am an apostle and paul was apostle to the gentiles so in ad 64 this occurred two years later after the gospel had been preached the ancestors the roman general came and surrounded jerusalem and then he retreated jesus says in matthew 24 verses 15 and on when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by daniel prophet stand in a holy place whosoever read it let him understand the same what happened in their day is going to be on the world with the larger scale in our day so when this happened when they passed that sunday law in our country jesus tells us in verse 16 into 20 he says that if you're on the housetop don't come back down to take anything out of the house it's time to flee if you're in the field don't come back to take anything it's time to go flee mean do what mean run not take your time it would be too late then to start packing up to move it would be too late to try to sell your homes it would be too late it's time to flee and that's what they did but the god's people was trapped inside that city at that moment but they never forgotten god's word because he said my word shall never fail so what happened is that the prophecy says that that great eastern gate that would take over 20 or up, up to 20 million to close fasten in the pavement in the deep in the earth uh it would open without hands at midnight god people who was the five wise virgin they fled to that gate and they watched and they waited and when sisters retreated god opened a way for them to escape that gate opened without hands and they fled all the way to Pella. So God heard their cries. Three and a half years they stayed, but the five foolish virgins, they went back to Jerusalem and stayed. When Titus came, he surrounded the city and nobody escaped. There were many who knew about the edible wild plants. They knew about vegan and vegetarianism. And they stole out by night to try to steal some dandelions and try to steal edible wild plants. Just like we, we have to learn these things now because what would happen, you are running in the woods and you are hungry and the angel's gonna feed us but they didn't say no three meals a day. And at the time you're gonna feel like you are dying. But at the time, can you imagine you kneeling down on the ground praying to God and you are kneeling on dandelions? or some plantains, or lamb quarters, all this food all around you, but you didn't take advantage of learning it now. So I wanted to say, let me move back now, because the little time of trouble starts officially when the son in law is in force. When it passes, then that starts. A lot of our people think we are in a little time of trouble now because of the plagues going on now around the world. These are not the seven last plagues. Look at the look at the locusts. All those locusts over in Africa and also the America and other places. So thick piles of them. And then you have all of these other things from one thing to God is just trying to wake us up. And these are warnings. So when that law is passed, church, we are not to guess at anything. We are to obey. And listen, we ought to have patience, patience in these last days. If we don't have patience, Satan will lose, will, uh, 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 he'll gain a march on us. So move to, we are instructed when that law is passed, we are to move to one or three places 
to live during that time. We're supposed to be living there now. But one is the small towns, and when you read the Spirit of Prophecy, she also said the small cities. So small towns or small cities, and also that's away from the large cities, accessible to the large cities. Also, the villages. You have villages all around, settlements, or rural places out in the country. Country Living, page 22, and I'd like to read this one little statement here. It's found in the, uh, it's found in Country Living. And I would like to read it here relating to the country. And this is page 22. It began here, it is not the purpose of God that his people should colonize or settle together in large communities. The disciples of Christ are his representatives on the earth. And God designed that they shall be scattered all over the country. In towns, cities, and villages as light amidst the darkness of this world. They are to be missionaries for God by their faith and works testifying to the near approach of the coming Savior. So we can hear the steps of the Lord uh, uh, getting closer and closer. It says, when the restraining hand is removed, the destroyer began his work. Then in our cities, the greatest calamities will come. So if you got children, if you got seniors, you got all these people who is most vulnerable, God wants them to be out of the large cities because the worst calamities will come on our large cities. And here, he don't want our people to be caught up into that confusion and that wickedness because they are setting up in these small towns now we call urgent care, where there's no hospitals, but they have urgent care and they have other things throughout the, the little towns. It says, in the future, cities will certainly feel the terrible results of earthquakes and fires. Cities will be destroyed by flood and by lightning. Out of the cities is my message at this time. The end is near and every city is to be turned upside down in every way. There will be confusion in every city. Everything that can be shaken is to be shaken, and we do not know what will come next. The judgments will be according to the wickedness of the people and the light of truth that they have had, and we understand that Atlanta is really sitting on the bullseye because we have been preached more than a lot of places, and the wickedness and so here we go on, it says, decide to leave the large cities. Educate our people to get out of the cities into the country where they can obtain a small piece of land and make a home for themselves and their children. Here long there will be such strife and confusion in the cities that those who wish to leave them will not be able to. And in the providence of God, we can secure places away from the cities. The Lord would have us do this. There are troublous times before us, and we are not to just go out of fear. At that time, remember, uh, the time is going to come, according to Revelation chapter 13, starting at verses 11. You will find... John saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two, two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Lamb-like, Christ-like, but it was speak like a dragon. That's the devil. You want to know who the devil is? Look at Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. That old devil called the devil and Satan and all of this. Now here uh, it says that uh, concerning... Concerning the food, 
because there will be famine in these last days. Because when you say pestilence, start from Genesis to Revelation, on that same line you'll see where it says, and these are judgments of God, is coming down on, on different groups. It says that famine, no, it says pestilence, and then it says famine. Famine, a lot of times, follow pestilence. And we know that right now with what's going on in our world with this virus and other things, look at the, the uh, food supply. And it's getting shorter. We don't know how bad things are going to get. So we ought to have our own little gardens. Where He's not telling us to become a farmer, but we would have our own gardens where we can grow our own food. And it's right now, it says one to two hours after you pluck your food, it become it start losing its nutritious value. And so we go on where it says about the food, uh, a stir of, of the prophets of kings, page 184, Satan says, the world will become mine. I will be the ruler of the earth, the prince of the world. I will so control the minds on my power that God's Sabbath shall be a special object of contempt, a sign. I will make the observance of the seventh day a sign of disloyalty to the authority of earth. Human laws will be made so strenuous that men and women will not dare to observe the seventh-day Sabbath. He says, for fear of wanting food and clothing, they will join with the world in transgressing God's law. The world will be holding on to my dominion, and that was the mildest test that God could have given man when he gave them, uh, uh, the, just told them not to eat of the forbidden fruit. And they was not even hungry when, so now God, Christ, when he was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, he won, he walked those tracks, and he gained the victory. And here it says, and I want to save this because this was in 1976. Some of us was around in 73, 74, and 75 when we had the Arab oil embargo. We had the sugar shortage. We had the beef shortage, all these things. This United States, the 200 beasts of Revelation 13, verses 11 through 17, uh, they came with, up with a plan to use food as a weapon. And they said that the nations of the world, whether, and we was uh, during that time, remember the Cold War? They said, you can have all the bombs you want, but if you don't have food, uh, a hungry people is a dangerous people. So the United States moved forward to control the food of the world. They joined with Mexico and Canada to control the food. So now it says potent U.S. weapon, Earl Buck's food. And, and as we go on, it says that the uh, grain as a weapon, and that was in the year 1980 when uh, uh, Iran and Iraq went to war. The United States started using grain as a weapon. And then we move on where it says food, a potent weapon. And he says down here, there is no Western Hemisphere to discover, no more virgin prairies to plow. Increasingly, other nations are becoming dependent on the United States for continuous supply of basic food. In the last scenes of this earth's history, war will rage. There will be pestilence, plagues, and famine. The waters of the deep will overflow their boundaries. Property and life will be destroyed by fire and the floods. And we know the tsunamis and all. History will repeat itself. Now watch how the Lord don't want us to perish. He's doing everything to save us. And look how Noah had this seven and a half days after he had preached 120 years, as the animals, the signs was coming, the animals coming to the ark two by two and seven by seven in pairs. And then the birds, you see the sky turned black with birds, but the people didn't go in. Now we have, at the days of Noah, one after another. So from Genesis to Revelation, all, listen church, all of our prophets wrote more about our day than their day. And so history repeats itself during this last generation. Everything will push to the last generation so we will not have no excuse. It's time to set our house in order. It's time to get ready. 
there's no time to fear because we are to lean on the Lord. So history repeat itself during the last generation. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 15, it says, That which has been is what? Now. And that which is to be has already been. You see how history repeat itself. Each of the ancient prophets wrote less for their time than for ours. Uh, you have 1 Corinthians uh, 10 and 11. It says, now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our ammunition upon whom the ends of the world are come. You see, this generation, and Jesus said, this generation shall not pass. We have all these things to look at. The Bible has accumulated and bound up together its treasure for this last generation. All the great events and solemn transactions of Old Testament history have been and are repeating themselves in the church in these last days. I want you to see a chart now. Uh, I want you to see this chart that the Lord has given me uh, some time ago. And he gave, and I was an artist, as he led me to draw this chart out. And this chart has been studied by the Reviewer and Herald, and they are to publish it and also Pacific Press. And it has been, uh, I went, it went to the um, Library of Congress and they studied this chart for seven and eight months. And they gave me the certificate of uh, the copyright on it showing that it has never been uh, used or anything. So here and there, I'm not gonna read all this. It just says, where are we in time? And you'll see 400, you know, the 2300 years of prophecy of Daniel Eight, chapter verse 13 to 14, uh, God gave, that was 2300 years from, what, uh, from 457 B.C. all the way down to 1844. Now, the first 490 years was given to the Jews to finish that crown, to anoint the Holy One. But we find that, we find that uh, 490 years started at 457 and ended in 34 AD when they stoned Stephen. Jesus was crucified in the midst of the week because he was baptized in the, in the year AD 27. When John looked up and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which take away the sins of the world. We know that Jesus came on time and he was anointed. Even the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So. Then he was crucified three and a half years later, and three and a half years later after that, ended the Jewish 490 years. 490 years. P Peter and them asked, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times seven? He said, no. Seven times 70. That's 490 times, and a time in Bible prophecy is a year. So here we go that uh, now the Jews had their day. What about our day? Watch how history repeating itself in our day because uh, the spirit of prophecy says, uh, she said, standing on the threshold of the great and solemn event, many of the prophecies are about to be fulfilled in quick succession. Past history will be repeated. And now watch this now. Starting, and for those who have a pen or calculator, you start with the year 1517. Remember that, was the, that sparked the Protestant Reformation by Martin Luther when he nailed the 95 Theses to the door. God used the Protestant, the protest one, to protest against that power that was wearing out the saints of the Most High. So in 1517, when he called them up, and then we went on, we had the, uh, uh, why we have Calvin and we have the, the Lutherans, you have the Methodists, you have the Baptists, and all these Protestants popped up in the Seventh day Adventist church with the last one. And here we come down to the year 2007. Now, count from the, from the year 1517 to the year 2007. This was a period for the Protestant. Watch this now. In 2007, 
that was at the time when the Protestant course was changing over from Protestant to Catholic. That was when they were joining back with the Catholic Church. So now, 490 years ended in 2007. I won't go into it now, but it'll show that Protestantism lost that status in 2007. And so watch this now, from 1517 to the year 2007. How many years was that? You count it up, it's 490 years, the same as the Jews had. So let's go on to, this is fulfillment of prophecy. It says, and, and watch this now, how all of our prophets, what they, they wept, church, they wept when they saw our day. They wept, and our people going around like nothing going to happen. But watch what it says here, Daniel. Daniel, it says, uh, uh, then it says, Daniel says, at verse four, uh, 13 and 14, it says, Then I heard a holy one uh, speaking, and another holy one said that a certain one, and I'm going And it asked a question here about how long, how long, and it says, uh, before these things be. And he said unto me, for 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be clean. Gabriel interpreted the vision. He interprets the vision. Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking to make um, the meaning that suddenly that stood before me one having an appearance of a man and, and heard uh, and it, it goes on down. It says, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of the lake, Eliah, you, you, like you who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Now, Daniel saw the time of the end, and we're going to move on to the next slide here because it says, and the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. You see that? He fainted when he saw our day because it was for the last day. And our people still think that, like, there's nothing going to happen. When we see the little time of trouble, we don't know that the four winds going to blow on this country. It says, and, I, and John, John the Revelator. Remember John uh, in Revelation chapter 5, verses 2 to 5, it says, And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming a loud voice who is worthy to break the seal and open the, the scroll. But no one in heaven or earth or under the earth or under, can open the seal, the scrolls, or even look there, look inside it. John says, I wept and wept because no one was found worthy. But he told him, do not weep, John, because the, the uh, lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David and has triumphed. And he, has, he is able to open the seal. So Jesus is the one came on the scene. So John even wept when he saw, and do you know, verse 17 of chapter 6 of Revelation, John goes on after he saw the island, different things moving out of the midst of the sea, and different things happened. John, uh, the heaven rolling back, John cried out, who shall be able to stand? And so John also wept. And let's look what Jesus, let's see what Jesus did. <coughs> Luke 19 verses 41 through 44. It says that when he was came, he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Jesus did not just only weep because he was riding on a donkey and they were throwing palm branches in the way. And when Jesus looked ahead and saw Jerusalem, he wasn't weeping because of his life. He wept because he could see the peoples inside that city. He said, war to the woman that gets with child and gives suck in those days. They couldn't wait for the baby, 
baby to be born, to come out from between their feet, for them to eat the children for, for food. And then yet Jesus didn't see only that day. He looked all the way down to, through 2,000 years to our day. And he saw our day, our cities being surrounded in the world, and it's going to be far worse than what happened to Jerusalem. It says what came on Jerusalem is only a faint shadow of what happened to Jerusalem. So Jesus wept bitterly. Okay. <clears throat> now, I want you to see about our cities this, this week. This morning, America in crisis. Protests in at least 140 cities coast to coast following the death of George Floyd in police custody. The National Guard activated in more than 20 states. Curfews imposed, thousands arrested. In downtown Minneapolis, a tanker plowing onto a packed highway, sending people running for their lives. In Boston, an SUV ramming straight into a group of protesters. And flames seen from the historic St. John's Church in Washington. <laughs> In Atlanta, two officers fired after the violent arrest of two college students. Massive looting breaking out in Los Angeles. State of emergency declared. So many questions this morning about who's really behind the most violent protests. Angry scenes outside the White House. Protesters shoot off fireworks. News that President Trump was moved to an underground bunker by Secret Service on Friday. The president calling for overwhelming force to stop the protests. A new video this morning of what appears to show the moments before George Floyd was pinned to the ground and died. An officer leaning into the police car, scuffling with Floyd. Ex-officer Derek Chauvin now behind bars on suicide watch. But will the other officers face charges? George Floyd's brother joins us live this morning as the family calls for more serious charges. An alert this morning about the danger of protests in the middle of a pandemic. New fears that COVID-19 could spread in those crowds among demonstrators as the number of cases tops 6 million worldwide. And signs of hope and humanity. Police. Now to the more of the protests that are sweeping the nation. Many of them, many of them were peaceful. We have to keep that in mind. They were peaceful during the day, but chaos did break out after dark in many cities across the country. Eva Pilgrim joins us now from Minneapolis with the very latest. Good morning, Eva. Good morning, Robin. Yeah, you can see the destruction here behind me, but I want to show you what was painted on this building, this mural that was here before all this. It says, Stop Violence, and that is the call from so many this morning. Overnight, protests from coast to coast, the seventh night of protests following the death of George Floyd. In St. Louis, a night of destruction, buildings on fire, four police officers shot during a face-off with a late-night crowd trying to storm police headquarters. Some coward. Five shots at officers, and, and now we have four in the hospital. But thankfully, and, and thank God, they're alive. Riots breaking out in Seattle after hours of peaceful protesting. The crowd trying to break through barricades, pushing toward a police precinct, throwing rocks, bottles, and fireworks at cops. In Las Vegas, an officer shot in the head overnight right on the Vegas Strip near Circus Circus. Another shot downtown near the federal courthouse. <laughs> In Buffalo, a terrifying scene after two officers were hit by a vehicle at the scene of a protest, leaving at least one in serious condition. Officials saying the driver was not deliberately targeting law enforcement. In New York City, thousands marched down the streets in a largely peaceful protest. The highest ranking uniformed member of the NYPD taking a knee with those gathered in Washington Square Park. Let New York show the country. How this is done. But looting attempts began later in the night as Governor Cuomo's newly announced 11 p.m. citywide curfew approached. Mayhem breaking out on Fifth Avenue as our Stephanie Ramos reported live. Things are getting wild here at Rockefeller Center here in New York City. It's bad. We're feeding in live. And no. Hold it. Now, uh, here it says, then I saw that the seven last plagues were soon to be poured out upon those who have no shelter, yet the world regarded them no more than they would so many drops of water that were about to fall. I was then made capable of enduring the awful sight of these plagues. I want you to know that, let's move on. Uh, I want you to know that um, 
she said that I saw that his anger was dreadful and terrible, and he, sh and if he should stretch forth his hand or lift it in anger, the inhabitants of the world would be as though it had never been. Terror seized me, she said. I fell on my face and before the angel and begged of him to cause his sight to be removed to hide it from me, for it was too dreadful. I saw the saints leaving the cities and the villages and associating together in companies, living in the most solitary places. I want you to know now that when she saw our day, she saw she was it was so bad that she couldn't endure the sight. The angel had to strengthen her to be able to just look upon it. But church, we are the one to live during this time because this generation shall not pass. And this, what you've seen in the, in the um, streets of this week in our cities, this is only a drop in the bucket is what's coming. I'm sorry because when the four winds, according to Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, that holding back the four winds of strife, it says that uh, when they are loose, it says all the elements of strife will be let loose. And from the north, east, south, and west, from the four winds, so this country will be wrecked. So that's why the Lord don't want us to be near these heavy populated centers because they will be attacked for the enemy, the terrorist attacks. So behold, it says... Um, yeah. It says, Behold, uh, he cometh. I want you to see what it says here in James chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, because we've been studying about this generation shall not pass. Jesus said, When you see all of these things, know that it is near, even at the doors, and that this generation shall not pass till all is fulfilled. Heaven and earth may pass, but my word shall not pass. So he said that when you see all of these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. And so here it says, it says, be patient. Be ye also patient. Uh, establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned, behold, the judge standeth before the door. So we see that the judge is standing before the door now. And now we see all these things. Uh, um, the next one. The, the, we see all these things moving on. Now, we, some of us remember, uh, and I want you to, when you go home or, or while you are at home, because we should be sheltered in place, maybe. But if you're not, write this down when you can read it. Uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. No, I won't. I just tell Okay. Okay. 2 Kings. Okay, I will read. And in the days of Hezekiah, in the days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Ammon, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thy house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. And church, all of us, it's time to set our house in order. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember how now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore, and it came to pass before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court that the words of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people. Thus says the Lord, the God 
of David, thy father. I have heard thy, pr thy prayers. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal them. I, I will heal thee. On the third day, thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thee, uh, unto thy days, fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the land of the uh, kings of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for my service, servant David's sake. <coughs> And so here, I want to stay with you and all of us. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We are to lay all our plans before the Lord. It's time to set our house in order. And now we go, we go to here. I want you to notice this picture here. I had a dream, and I must say that I am blessed beyond blessed of the Lord, because he has blessed me just like he has blessed all of you from time to time. And I know you have a story to tell. I'll never forget in the year of 1977, I was asleep at my house in Columbus, Georgia. About three o'clock in the morning, I awakened. But I had this dream. Let me tell you the dream. What happened is that in my dream, I was taken to heaven. And as I was standing there in the throne room of God, and this picture is the closest thing I could come to, and it's, it's far beyond this, but it was a scene similar to this, that I was faced, standing there looking up at the glory of the rainbow over the throne, and looking at the the, the God, uh, the, not, all you can see is brightness there. Then you see all of the angels, thousands, they was all around the throne. All of a sudden, Jesus was, he put his arms around me, and I'll never forget, he was on the right side, he was standing there next to me. The angel came from the left side, came over directly side of me on my left side, and had this big book this large book where I could read it. And he put it right in, in front of me as Jesus' right hand, as he went down the page, that page with the names on, the, on, the, on that page on the right side. When Jesus got halfway of that page, all of a sudden his finger stopped on a name. When he stopped on a name, I began to boo-hoo and start crying. And he says, it's time. And I said, Lord, she's not ready. It was my mother's name. And I started crying, saying, Lord, she's not ready. Please give her some more time. She's not ready. And do you know the Lord granted her some more time? I will not exaggerate to you all. And I will not lie. Here, I came out of the dream. And I was still crying. I didn't have a phone at my house, so I ran down about a block to the payphone, three o'clock in the morning, and called my mother. And, uh, and she wanted to know what was wrong with me. I said, are you okay? She said, yes, I'm okay. What's wrong? And I began to tell her what I had seen, and she assured me she was okay. Church, do you know, sometime after that, it was a month or two after that, my mother got sick unto death. And what happened is that the doctors called all of us to her bedside. I had finished, got my discharge from the army, but I had been back in the reserve for about seven or eight months, uh, seven or eight years. I went to my superior and asked her to, I need to go to the emergency room, to the hospital to see my mother. And she refused. And I hate to say this, church, but Satan calls the vision. And she would let the white guys go but with me, I was supposed to be in the best medic they had out in Fort Benning at the hospital. And yet, when I asked her to go to the hospital to see my mother, she said no. I am sorry I'll say this. I'm not sorry, but when that happened, I said, I'm through. 
I quit the, the reserve because I had fulfilled my duty in the army. And I walked away and went to see my mother. And here I have never, ever went back to the, to the military, to the reserve. And so my mother pulled through. And do you know, she lived and we got, we had Bible studies. And when my mother was a primitive Baptist and she was a, a, a clerk for about 40 something years. And when we had Bible studies, she learned about the Sabbath. She was so upset with her ministers, wonder why they are lying. When she learned about the food, you were not supposed to eat pork and all this stuff. Then she wanted to be baptized. Mama became the best Sabbath keeper you want to find. Amen. She went, you better not go out and, and get your mail out of the box during the Sabbath hours and stuff. Not at her house. So when she was on her deathbed, she was, she was uh, in a coma. And when she came through, she told the family she was ready. She was tired now. And then they looked up, and mom was laying up in the hospital. The Lord impressed me because I had prayed to be in her presence when she passed. Everybody was around the clock with her. But that evening, I was miles away. The Lord said, go to the hospital. He didn't say she read the pie. He says, go. We need to know the voice of the Lord ourselves. I'd taken off. When I got to the hospital, walking down the hallway, my baby sister Lula looked up and saw me coming. And she said, Fred, Fred. It's happening, it's happening. So I ran in there and my sister, four of us, uh, three of them, and me, I made four. They had me to hold her head and rub her hair and tell her something, but the Lord stopped me. He says, you was the one want to be here upon her passing. This was in my spirit. He says, now you tell, you say what you want to say. I began to thank the Lord for her life. And as I began to speak to her, you could see her eyes bucking. And then that long breath left her body. And I was there. So the Lord showed me after that, she lived for 23 years Amen. after that. So that's the, and I want to close out with saying that we, it's time to set our house in order. It's no time to just let time waste. And let's time to hear the words of the Lord. Because these are not my words about moving out of the cities. These are not my words. And we are not the, the fear but let's lay it before the Lord and ask him to guide us because he was the one is to give us instruction. May God bless us is my prayer. And, and as I pray, Lord, we thank you. We want to praise you for speaking to us today. Be with all of us, O oh Lord, and be with the bereaved families around the world, Lord, from the virus and from the, the death of Florida. And we just pray that you will be with all of the others who have died by the brutality. So keep us, O oh Lord, and now, Lord, help us to set our house in order and help us to be able to stand when we see you coming in the clouds. Help us to be ready to go back home with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen and amen. At this time, we will ask for those who have questions or have a comment, we will ask at this time that you go ahead and ask your questions and your comments. Are there any questions? While well, I'm switching over. I have a question. Yes, please. Can you hear me? Yes. This is Olivia. When you talk about moving into the cities, I mean, moving out of the cities, how far out would um, you recommend we move? Well, uh, Brother Irving, uh, is he there? Yes, he's here. Go ahead, Brother Irving. When you... <clears throat> On all our cities, we know like Atlanta, you got the metropolitan area, but you want to get outside of the metropolitan area. Go to, she says that where the, where the, um, you got to go where you won't have the interference with the enemy by being so close because when they have, uh, they pass certain laws like, for instance, uh, water restriction, that covers the metropolitan area most of the time. With where I live out in the country, we don't even have to have our, our mission, our cars to be tested and all. When you live away from, so when you go out, uh, um, out where the houses are not so close together, 
and where you could get at least an acre of land. She mentioned you could get a half acre. You could get a smaller acre of, of enough land for a family to grow a garden or up to two, three acres of land, two to three acres of land. Some can join together with others. And so we are not to have a large group, but live outside of the large cities where the, where, um, major cities. the major cities, the major large cities. And so, um, and, and, and you can tell when you get, because where we live, little small towns, there are always small towns, small cities, look for those, and small uh, villages and rural areas. I live not far from Richland. That's a small city, but there are, and so look for the small town villages, look for those things. And that's, we'll be safe because we are being obedient and lay it before the Lord. He will guide us. Yes. So are you saying maybe an hour or two outside of the cities? Not necessary because we need to be accessible to the cities and all. Mm -hmm. But we could be, if, if, it, if the Lord opened it up for you to be a my, a hour away, or, or when I say 30 minutes, I live 30 minutes from the large city of Columbus. That's a long ways, a long ways. And uh, you get there in 30 minutes, you could be sitting on the expressway in traffic here in 30 minutes. And stuff so don't think it's so far away but 30 minutes is a long ways from because columbus is the second largest city in georgia and so i just want you to know that the small towns villages and rural areas because they are still the same some of them now as they were way back okay. hmm. any other questions thank you and the thing about it Olivia, you make sure you want to pray about it and yes. ask the lord to show you where he wants you to be because he may want you to be in an area to witness to others uh, that's what we still supposed to be doing we should not be so far like some people go off the grid and no. lay up in the mountains and they up there by themselves no but you, right. we still got a work to be done and he just don't want us in the city he want us out of the city that we go back to the city to be able to do the work that needs to be done. And we also, the small towns, villages, or rural areas, they have been neglected through the years, and we need to be witnessing to them right. and all. So and then we go back and forward to the cities too, to, like Enoch's, you know. Yeah. All right. Very good question. Thank you, Miss Olivia. Are there any other questions? Okay, I have a question over here in the chat. In 2000, 2003, the law of God was re-anointed. <laughs> what happened in 2007 in the Gentile prophetic history? Okay, I'm glad you asked that question because if you count from 1517 to the year 2000, that was 483 years. And so that was seven years left for 490 years. So from 2000, that's when the Pope made his apologies for the atrocities through the years. So then, three and a half years after that, that's when the 10th commandment, Judge Roy Moore and the commandments, uh, they were discussing this all over our country about the 10 commandments. So that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And then they was trying to pass a Ten Commandment Day, which was supposed to be around the 7th of May of 2006. But what they decided to do, when they started this, we went out in the streets at Seventh-day Adventists, and we started passing out the National Sunday Law books, and we went all over. And so now we had to turn the, the uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Eddie Long, Bishop Eddie Long, and and uh, Creflo Dollar, and, and Bishop T.D. Jakes, and and Joel Osteen, all these men, they started organizing a Ten Commandment Day. They were going to have parades all over our country. But when they saw what the Seventh-day Adventist Church was doing, bringing the attention to the Fourth Commandment about the Sabbath, they shut it down. Now they're working their way in darkness. So three and a half years later after that, that was when the uh, 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 490 years expired. So now you can expect things of being working their way in darkness now. And we don't never know how soon the son of law will, but we know it's going to be soon. Okay. Thank you for that question. Any other questions or comments?
Okay. Well, I hope this has been very helpful for you to, uh, like Fred mentioned, getting your house in order. It is time, folks, for us to make our election sure. Like Joshua said, in my home, or my house, we shall serve the Lord thy God. We got a work to do. Uh, he said the fields are ready, but the labors are few. Are we going to be part of that? to help get this gospel to all nation, kindred, and tongues so our Lord and Savior could come soon. Uh, we got some good news. I talked with Sister Abraham. We prayed for Makiva last week. Uh, she has gone through the surgeries and uh, she is awake and so forth. So uh, they transported her closer to the base. Uh, so they, uh, she's got a long way to go, but the Lord has uh, blessed that young lady. The story that Sister Abraham told me, the Lord put his angels around about her because she had the accident at night. Uh, they didn't find her until the next morning. Uh, and she had some broken uh, bones in her spine as well as her foot. So the Lord put his angels around about her uh, to find her. And she was five hours away from the base. So again, let us continue to pray for her, and let's continue to pray for our young people. Yes. And our young people, we want to let you know that Pastor uh, Carter will be uh, presenting next week uh, to the youth. Uh, so he will be on for next week as well. Uh, so are there any other questions before we wrap up? Uh, my question to you, are you ready to stand before the for God? If you're not, there's a lot of heart searching we have to do. And in this day and time, uh, we have the time to deal with our heart searching and see if there's anything in our lives that need to be removed or any characteristics that need to be moved that is not of Christ. So uh, please let us be uh, mindful to spend time with our families, Spend time with those who are lonely, who you know are living by themselves. Just pick up the phone and say, hello, how are you doing? Uh, and that sort of thing. So let's keep all of our uh, ones that are shut in, let's keep them in prayer as we go throughout this pandemic and throughout the little time of trouble. Uh, like I said, we haven't seen anything yet, but are we ready? All right, at this time, uh, let's see. Uh, Elder uh, Watkins, would you mind giving us a closing prayer? Yes, ma'am. Glad to do that. Let's bow our heads. Gracious Lord, we do thank you so much for the Sabbath day, and we thank you for this ministry and for all of the participants and presenters that have presented today. Lord, through this holistic means of addressing our spirituality, our physical health. And as we look out at the world and see what is happening, we pray that your Holy Spirit would abide with us. We pray a blessing on this ministry and on those participants that have lent their time and service to the community and to those who are participating by listening. We pray that you would lead and guide us through your Holy Spirit, Lord, to search our hearts and to prepare adequately. And that is to allow your spirit to prepare us. And we just pray for the desirous spirit to be changed, to be motivated, to do the work that needs to be done in these last days. We thank you, Lord, for watching over us and protecting us from hurt, from harm and danger as we see all these things happening around us. We thank you for continuing to shield us with your hands from this coronavirus and this pandemic. Lord, the times in which we live are very serious and we cannot survive or thrive without you. Lord, we pray that you would reign and rule in our hearts and in our minds, lead and guide us. And through the rest of the Sabbath, allow us to enjoy rest and peace. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And we have uh, some of the future uh, seminars we will be having. We will have one on disaster preparedness uh, because we are entering the tornado and hurricane seasons. 
and we want to make sure that you are prepared. Uh, also, uh, we will have uh, the U.S. and Bible prophecy uh, as well. And then we will continue with our country time living. of trying to, and, and also we will talk about country living. We will yes. help those who are wanting or thinking about moving to the country or the small town. We will also help you uh, through that process. And uh, because it is a process, you just can't do it overnight. Uh, so make sure that uh, uh, we have uh, books that yes. you can read. One is called Country Living by Ellen White, yeah. and then the other one is City from, city, from to city to Country Living. And you can find those at your book and Bible house, the ABC stores. Uh, you can find those books and start reading those uh, that will give you uh, some uh, assistance. And also, uh, we will, I would try to pull down the videos as well, uh, some of the videos to send to you uh, for those. Now, if you cannot find the book, we do have it. Uh, if you just send me your email address, I'll be glad to send those yours. books uh, to you, okay, uh, via the PDF uh, format. All right, with that being said, we'd like to thank you again for participating and being with us as we share the word of the Lord. Let us continue uh, throughout these Sabbath hours to remember that we still doing the Sabbath hour, that we still uh, need to praise our Lord and give him all the glory on this Holy Sabbath day. And we pray that you will have a blessed and safe and healthy week as you go throughout this week. Yes. Thank you so much. And for those who want to just sit back and listen to the music, behold, he comes because he is coming. Yes. And he's coming to mighty crowds. Amen. And Lord, Amen. have mercy. Thank you, Jesus, Amen. that we have that promise. Yeah. He is coming. So behold the lamb because he's coming. coming. Amen.
information you can reach me at 678-613-6397 or you can email me uh, this video will be uploaded this afternoon so uh, you can watch it on YouTube uh, we are putting all the videos up there on YouTube so again be blessed and thank you Okay, at this time, if there are no other questions or comments, I will go ahead and close out the meeting. Um, go ahead and